for us, we are so proud. Our little program uh, tonight is under the chairman of um, Dr. Uh, Joe Awad. Joe Awad is, uh, uh, sorry for Joe, for Dr. Joe Awad. He is my colleague from uh, Egypt. He is initially from Tanta uh, University. He graduated in 2008. He earned his master's degree in anesthesia and intensive care from Tanta University in 2015. Uh, first, I met uh, Joe, of course, in Egypt before coming to Ireland, and uh, he is here in Ireland uh, from 2018. He earned his uh, membership in, uh, uh, of the College of the Anesthesiologists, and finally he got his fellowship in anesthesia for the College of the Anesthesiologists in Ireland. Now, Joe is a big achiever. He is anesthesia and the intensive care registrar in Tara uh, University Hospital, is one of the top hospitals in Ireland, in Dublin. And uh, he extended his um, work in um, ACLS co-director and the co-director of the Irish Heart Foundation. And he is one of the main instructor of the ACLS in, in Ireland. Uh, Joe, uh, all the floor for you. And uh, thanks for much and good luck. Uh, now, uh, our second and last lecture uh, to, uh, this night is presented by uh, Dr. Ahmed Abbas. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Abbas is uh, one of the highlight Egyptians uh, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, he is a senior registrar of anesthesia, pediatrics, intensive care and pain medicine in Kremlin Hospital, Dublin in Ireland. He was graduated from Mansoura University in 2005. He had his master's degrees in anesthesia from Ain Shams University in 2011. Uh, Dr. Abbas has a wide experience in many tertiary hospitals in Egypt, KSA, and Ireland in the field of anesthesia, intensive care, and pain medicine. Uh, he is also a fellow of the College of Anesthesiologists of Ireland, and he holds the Irish Diploma in Pain Medicine. Uh, his special interest is in acute and chronic pain management, for which he got his training in pain medicine in Cork University Hospital, one of the biggest university hospitals in Ireland. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is going to speak tonight about something that many of us uh, may inadvertently uh, underestimate, um, which is uh, chronic post-surgical pain. And Dr. Ahmed promised us <laughs> that he will change our practice to the better uh, after this lecture. So uh, off you go, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yusuf Awad, for your um, uh, introduction. Thank you, for, uh, thank you, Dr. Saad and the panelists for uh, uh, your kind invitation for uh, this uh, lecture series tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ranjit, as well, for this outstanding presentation. And um, thank you, uh, all our audience, for uh, being with us uh, tonight. So today we are going to speak um, about uh, a relatively new uh, topic, which is the chronic post-surgical uh, pain. And as uh, Joe mentioned before, a lot of anesthetists doesn't have enough awareness about chronic post-surgical pain. And also it's an important topic for uh, exam purposes as it started to show up in fellowship exams recently quite a lot. So uh, first, there is no uh, conflict of uh, interest to declare from my side. And uh, the objective of this lecture tonight is to review the epidemiologic uh, evidence of chronic post-surgical pain um, describe pain mechanism of uh, acute uh, uh, transformation to chronic or to chronic transition and possible impact of early intervention, and to review current evidence of uh, preventive uh, measures. So interest in chronic uh, post-surgical pain has grown since the finding that more than fifth of the patient attending some chronic pain services describe surgery as the cause of their chronic pain. Um, the problem is not limited to major surgeries. Even common minor procedures such as hernia repair have significant risk of uh, chronic pain. Uh, so chronic post-surgical pain can represent significant annoyance to the patient leading to functional limitation, psychological trauma, as well as problems for uh, the operative team, uh, of course, in the form of feeling of frustration and disappointment and sometimes litigation. So chronic post-surgical pain is important uh, um, to have kind of awareness about it because 
it increase analgesic use, uh, have some kind of restriction to the activity of daily livings of the patient, and it, it, it reflects significant effect on the quality of life for the patient. And of course, for the uh, health uh, care system, it increased the utilization. So chronic post-surgical pain was first described in 1999 by Macri and Davis. And then um, uh, later, they have given the first definition of chronic post-surgical pain by Macri in 2001. And he described it as a pain that developed after surgical intervention and lasts at least two months. Other cause of pain has to be excluded, in particular pain from a condition preceding the surgery. And this was in 2001, and uh, it was published in this article. Uh, soon after an update, definition of chronic post-surgical pain followed that. And uh, it was proposed by Werner and Kungsgaard in 2014. And they give working diagnosis for, for chronic post-surgical pain as pain resisting more than three months. If you can remember, the, the first uh, definition was only two months. Now it became three months after the surgery. Pain not pres present before surgery or that has different characteristic or increased intensity uh, from preoperative pain and it should be localized to the surgical site or any referred area. And of course, uh, other possible causes of pain should be excluded, for example, cancer recurrence and infection. So how about the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain? If you can see from this table, uh, there's a lot of surgery which can cause chronic post-surgical pain. And uh, uh, as you can see here in the middle, some of it um, have high incidence, and uh, this represents also the estimated in incidence of chronic severe, severe pain. So in terms of incidence of chronic pain at all, either mild, moderate, or severe, amputation was the highest, followed by thoracotomy and mastectomy. And interestingly, as we mentioned, inguinal hernia as well, represent high, very high risk could reach 63% in some uh, studies of co developing coronary post-surgical pain. Also, a coronary bypass grafting, cesarean section, cholecystectomy, vasectomy, and some dental surgeries. Then I have another table from uh, British Medical Journal uh, uh, Education. And what my, caught my attention here uh, was the breast augmentation surgery. Uh, and I found that it has an incidence of 13 to 38%. Uh, of developing chronic post-surgical pain. And I was wondering if the surgeon include the possibility of this chronic post-surgical pain in their surgical consent. Uh, also another uh, uh, surgery which can include uh, alia crest bone harvest site, which is very, very minor procedure during uh, a big, uh, uh, another big procedure just to take a graft. It represents uh, um, a risk of 30% developing chronic post-surgical pain. So in order to understand uh, the acute to chronic pain transition, we need to go back a little bit to the basics. And uh, as we know, there is pain receptor which uh, uh, can transmit signals to A delta and C fiber, which A delta is the rapid conduct conducting myelinated fiber, and C fiber, was, which is a small, uh, a small in diameter, and it can conduct more slowly than all this fiber will relay in the spinal cord. Then from the spinal cord, it will go through spinothalamic and spinoreticular tract to the higher center. Then it will be projected in the uh, cortex. So a lot of modification of pain projection happen in this level and in the higher uh, subcortical uh, level. And we have a lot of neurotransmitter which can modify the pain transmission. So we have glutamate, which, which is a major excitatory neurotransmitter, which is responsible for a phenomena, we'll talk about it later, called central sensitization. And we have the NMDA receptor agonists, which is responsible for another, of another mechanism, which could contribute to the development of chronic post-surgical pain called uh, WENDA. So what is the possible uh, mechanisms of chronic post-surgical pain? Initially, everybody thought that chronic post-surgical pain happened due to nerve injury. And to be honest, there is no uh, clear uh, mechanism um, uh, that could fully explain the chronic post-surgical pain. So we like to believe that it's nerve injury during the surgery. Um, and then as a result of the surgery and the nerve injury, there will be some inflammatory and immune uh, reaction 
either due to the damage of the axon or due to release of inflammatory mediators in the surgical side. Uh, these act locally and can send frequent impulse to the spinal cord um, and cause hypersensitivity and ectopic neural activity contribute to the central sensitization. So central sensitization occur when uh, repetitive, uh, painful, or nociceptive stimuli um, comes to the spinal cord and result in altered dorsal horn activity and amplification of sensory flow. This can lead uh, to some changes, uh, permanent changes or uh, long-term changes to the spinal cord in terms of death of inhibitory neurons. So there is inhibitory and there is excitatory neuron. And as a result of repetitive stimuli, these inhibitory neurons can be replaced by excitatory uh, one. And these changes lead to uh, uh, some evoked and spontaneous uh, symptoms associated with neuropathic pain, such as allodynia and hyperalgesia. And uh, as we know, allodynia is having painful sensation from non-painful stimuli and hyperalgesia exaggerating the mild painful stimuli to higher intensity uh, painful stimuli. So typically you can find the patient complain of, he will tell you oh, over this scar I have in my chest or uh, over my tummy, I can't tolerate the feeling of the cloth over my scar, which will be a, a painful stimulus translated from non painful stimulus, which is allodynia, and this is very common. Uh, however, the link between nerve damage during surgery and development of chronic post-surgical pain is not that easy. It's quite complicated. So not all patients with nerve damage develop chronic post-surgical pain, and those who develop chronic post-surgical pain do not necessarily have uh, neuropathic pain. So um, also some operation not associated with nerve injury and can uh, result in chronic post-surgical pain. So rather, in, rather than concentrating in the mechanism and try to understand it, while a lot of scientists are trying to search for the uh, causes, we better uh, focus in the risk factor, try to recognize what factors can lead to chronic post-surgical pain in order to prevent it. So as anything in the perioperative period, we can uh, classify it in uh, perioperative, interoperative, and postoperative. So starting from perioperative, existing um, uh, pain and the intensity of uh, perioperative pain. For example, if a patient has a trauma and, uh, and uh, he was in lower limb pain or chronic ischemia with lower limb or upper limb pain, and then afterwards he has a surgery to uh, have an amputation. So if this pain continued for one month in some studies, it should add strong prediction of chronic post-surgical pain. Also, young age is more associated with development of chronic post-surgical pain. In some studies, they found that breast cancer surgery uh, uh, related chronic post-surgical pain decreased by 5% for each year increase in the patient's age. Also, female are more susceptible to chronic post-surgical pain. And there is also some, some genetic uh, uh, susceptibility in the expression of some enzyme, which is responsible for neurotransmitter expression in the dorsal uh, horn cell. The most important from my point of view is the psychosocial factor. It has an important effect on any chronic pain, and this also includes chronic post-surgical pain. Um, as we say, chronic pain and psychological disorder follow the shadow of each other. So chronic pain can give rise to or uh, provoke uh, psychological uh, illness, and psychological illness could be presented as chronic pain as well. So also the cognitive and behavioral trait um, is really important factor in development of chronic post-surgical pain. So if the patient has a fear of surgery and his fear was not uh, addressed or uh, uh, there was no kind of communication uh, to adjust the patient expectation to pain after his surgery, this could uh, contribute to the development of chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, also, some patients by nature have uh, catastrophizing personality, so they are predicting pain and exaggerating their prediction to pain. Uh, Psychologic uh, construct of this person sometimes rumination, magnification, uh, uh, helplessness, and he have unrealistic pain expectation after surgery, which could be alleviated by uh, careful communication with this patient and explanation of the expected pain and uh, the uh, uh, lines of treatment. Also compensation claim, and for those who work in chronic pain uh, medicine, they know well that any patient associated with compensation claim, it may uh, start and have the same incidence like any other chronic pain, but as long as the compensation claim continued, 
this uh, contribute to the longevity of the symptoms and persistence of the symptoms later on. Uh, next group of factors, which is interoperative uh, uh, factors. For example, uh, the longer and uh, by implication more complicated operation are associated with more chronic pain. This may reflect the degree of tissue damage and degree of possible inflammation and also possibility of nerve uh, injuries. Always laparoscopic surgical approach result in less chronic pain after uh, a lot of surgeries like hernia repair and cholecystectomies in a lot of studies. Uh, repeated surgery, for example, for hernia repair, found to have a higher incidence uh, of moderate to severe pain intensity at uh, six and 12 months in a lot of uh, uh, studies. Uh, using electrocautery also may result in more chronic surgical, uh, post surgical pain compared with laser. Post operative uh, factor um, that could influence the development of chronic post surgical pain, including the uh, adjuvant interface intervention such as radiotherapy in cancer surgeries. Also, if there is bleeding or infection, because also this may reflect the possibility of uh, a lot of tissue damage and nerve injury in the post-operative period, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, symptoms and depression may contribute to development of chronic post-surgical pain. But the most important factor from my point of view is the severity of acute post-operative pain. Uh, so the, the, the severity of post-operative pain is a strong predictor of the development of chronic post-surgical pain. And also, again, this may reflect the degree of tissue damage or uh, the individual response to pain. How the patient deal with this kind of pain? Is he catastrophizing or is he realistic? Or if he tolerates or he doesn't tolerate, if he has fear and avoidance or he is confronting most important supporting the hypothesis is that repeated nociceptive stimulation during the perioperative period result in nervous system changes, such as uh, central sensitization. So my message here to my colleague anesthetist, uh, always don't underestimate the severity of acute postoperative pain. Pain is always what patient describe and always has plan A, P, C, even D for the management of postoperative pain and treat this post-operative pain adequately all the time, especially in the uh, uh, surgeries with, high, with higher risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain. And as we say, prevention is better than cure. It's um, uh, an important uh, phrase in managing any kind of illness, but in particular here today in chronic post-surgical pain, which is really, really very difficult to treat and could be prevented uh, by some simple measures that we can employ during our uh, anesthetic techniques. So uh, chronic post-surgical pain preventive techniques can be applied in perioperative time, and uh, uh, it could be perioperative analgesia, psychosocial uh, factors, or uh, surgical factors. But to be honest, currently there is no definitive way to prevent the occurrence of chronic post-surgical pain. It's, as I mentioned, still relatively new uh, era of researches and still there is no definite answer for a lot of questions. And there is various technique has been tried by anesthesiologist and surgeon to reduce the risk uh, with variable success. So starting with perioperative uh, analgesia, uh, considering the basophysiologic mechanism proposed to contribute to chronic pain, it would seem logic that a good perioperative pain control should have a long-term benefit by reducing central sensitization. And before we start uh, uh, talking about the measures that can be employed, we need to say more definitions here about perioperative analgesia. So we always hear about preemptive and preventive uh, analgesia. So preemptive analgesia by definition uh, is an analgesia that is delivered prior to skin incision. Here in surgery, we can say uh, analgesia that delivered before the nuxus stimulus, and the nuxus stimulus here is the skin uh, incision in uh, the chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, so preemptive epidural analgesia has has found to be um, having significant benefit in post-operative pain, as an acute post-operative pain. But we will talk if if it have any benefit for for chronic post-surgical pain uh, as well. Uh, benefits of other type of preemptive analgesia is, to be honest, not so clear yet. What, is, what about the preventive analgesia? So preventive analgesia described as an analgesic treatment that outlasts its expected duration. 
and it may be important to minimize chronic post-surgical pain. So a nutshell, uh, preemptive analgesia, analgesia is beneficial in prevention of acute uh, post-surgical pain, but preventive analgesia is to minimize the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain through a reduction in central sensitization. And to be effective in preventing sensitization of the nervous system, it should act over the period of time during which there is an inflammatory stimulus. So it should start in the perioperative period and continue with the patient as long as there is a source of pain. Um, also in the post-operative period. So the adoption of preventive analgesia technique rather than preemptive has shown benefit to prevent chronic post-surgical pain. So also multimodal analgesia as a term we used to hear it a lot and a lot of us uh, use it for acute pain. So the presence of pain before surgery and the severity uh, and duration of acute post-operative pain are predictor of chronic post-surgical pain uh, as mentioned because it leads to a spinal sensitization following trauma also it may transform acute pain to chronic pain. Um, so this can be prevented by aggressive treatment of acute pain. Uh, therefore, a good perioperative pain management is thought to prevent the occurrence of chronic post-surgical pain. And adopting multimodal approach to treat pain is a good way uh, to treat pain effectively with no risk of overdosage and subsequently risk of toxicity from a single agent. Uh, back to our uh, uh, pain pathway, as we mentioned, we have here uh, the uh, 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 nerve receptor and uh, the nerve fibers and the spinal cord, then the ascending tracts, the subcortical centers and cortical center. So this is where our drug uh, or pain medication uh, 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 should work. So here in the level of the receptor, we can use local anesthetic infiltration, we can use paracetamol, we can use non-steroids, and uh, in the nerve fibers, we can use uh, local anesthetic via peripheral uh, nerve catheter. Uh, also, uh, uh, in the spine, in the level of spinal cord, we can use local anesthetic, opioid, alpha antagonist agonist like uh, clonidine and dexamethasone. Uh, we have also an MDA antagonist like ketamine and also uh, non uh, steroids. Um, in the higher centers or the higher level of cortical centers, we have uh, opioid, alpha agonist paracetamol and also in MDA antagonists. This is what we call multimodal analgesia. So a lot of anesthetists they, they now are shifting their uh, practice from a single strong agent to multiple agent. Give paracetamol interoperatively, give non-steroids if available, clonidine, magnesium, IV, lignocaine. Uh, so this is in order to reduce uh, the uh, heavily reliance on uh, opiates in post-operative period. This improved the outcome and also it found to be uh, contributing to the prevention of uh, chronic post-surgical pain. So in terms of preventive analgesia or analgesia that have shown uh, some evidence for uh, the prevention of development of chronic post-surgical pain so far, we have regional anesthesia, we have the ketamine, we have the gabapentinoid, antidepressant and intravenous uh, lignocaine. So starting with, uh, regional, uh, with regional anesthesia, it may be possible to prevent nociceptive input into the dorsal horn. This is the, the, the key uh, uh, mechanism here. If you prevent this noxious stimulus from reaching the dorsal horn, you, you will prevent the central sensitization. And there was a Cochrane uh, review in 2013 found epidural analgesia for thoracotomy to be beneficial in reducing the risk of chronic post-surgical pain at six months and for also paravertebral block in reducing chronic post-surgical pain following uh, breast surgery uh, for breast cancer uh, at five and six uh, months. This is the, uh, uh, the, the systematic review, which was published in 2013 in BGA. So it's about regional anesthesia to prevent chronic pain after uh, surgery. Uh, also in terms of regional anesthesia, they found in some studies that spinal anesthesia has also been shown to be beneficial relative to general anesthesia in reducing the risk of chronic pain after cesarean section. Another one more benefit for the regional anesthesia over general anesthesia in cesarean section. Also perioperative epidural analgesia was found to reduce the incidence of severe uh, phantom limb uh, pain. In this interesting study uh, uh, by Carnicolos um, uh, and his colleague, they have 65 patients who underwent lower limb uh, amputation and they 
uh, use different uh, uh, protocols for pain management in pre, uh, intraoperative, and postoperative. So they compare patients who have preoperative epidural, intraoperative epidural, and postoperative epidural to others who have mix of epidural and PCA, and for those who never had an epidural before. And they found the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain using different pain scales in their patients is much, much lower. Notice that line in red for patient who has epidural, uh, pre, inter, and post-operative compared with other modalities of uh, pain control for other patients. Uh, and they found to have much less pain after six months uh, uh, of their uh, surgery. Uh, also, this is non-randomized uh, study uh, by uh, Borghi et al. examined the perioperative uh, uh, percutaneous insertion of peripheral nerve catheter uh, for the post-operative infusion of local anesthetic uh, following limb amputation. Interestingly, they used this uh, local anesthetic catheter uh, infusion for 30 days. Um, and they found that this incidence of phantom limb pain uh, after 12 months was 16% only, which is much, much less than the other uh, uh, studies. But the problem is, I don't think that every hospital and every department will be able to use uh, a, a local anesthetic infusion catheter or wound catheter uh, for uh, 30 uh, days. It's one of the limitations of this uh, application of this study. Uh, this study also showed that the infiltration of local anesthetic following removal of an earlier crest bone graft lead to lower iliac bone uh, chronic pain after four years of follow-up. Remember, we said the uh, uh, iliac uh, bone graft uh, uh, donor site uh, is one of the sites which has high incidence of chronic post-surgical pain, which was 30%. So uh, in essence, local anesthetic and regional block can significantly reduce the chronic post-surgical pain incidence. And rather than having this patient in the pain clinic for years, and do much harm for him in terms of dependence on pain medication, spending time in the pain clinics and a lot of pain procedure, uh, it would be much better if we will have kind of regional block for any surgery that uh, could be liable for chronic post-surgical pain. It's like, think about it. If, if patient comes for inguinal hernia, it would be much easier to stick a needle in his groin and inject some local anesthetic and uh, minimize the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain, which is a very simple procedure. Any patient for thoracotomy uh, uh, should have kind of regional anesthesia. Heavy reliance in opioid may not be adequate, may not be uh, good for post-operative uh, 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 period in terms of respiratory function and a lot of things. And also it doesn't minimize effectively the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. So think about regional all the time, whenever you can, stick a needle in the patient, either around the nerve, neuroaxial, or local wound infiltration. This will save a lot of time and effort to treat chronic post-surgical pain. The second drug in our list is ketamine, and it's another revive of an old-fashioned drugs, uh, which was um, like about to be uh, going extinct, then was revived by its, uh, um, a lot of anesthetists started to use it again for many reasons. One of the reasons that I think ketamine has booked his place again in our trolley is because his uh, effect in chronic and acute post-surgical pain. So as we know, ketamine is an MDA uh, receptor antagonist and uh, it's rarely used as a sole anesthetic due to psychosomatic, but it can be very useful uh, adjuvant to uh, drug in patient requiring high level uh, of uh, opioid. So it prevents an MDA receptor mediated window. You remember we mentioned two mechanisms in uh, chronic post-surgical pain was one central sensitization and the other one was wind up. So wind up is prevented by uh, 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 effectively by ketamine. Uh, a lot of anesthetists are using it now for pain control um, and the suggested uh, dose by uh, uh, a lot of studies is 0.2 to 0.5 milligram uh, per kg as a bolus. And some other studies suggested also it can, given, it can be given as infusion afterwards two to five microgram per kg uh, per minute in opioid naive patient. And it, it significantly reduced the requirement on, of opioid in post-surgical uh, time. And it also reduced the risk of opioid uh, hyperalgesia. 
There is also some strong data that perioperative in NDA receptor antagonists like ketamine show preventive analgesic effects. Uh, and this is thought to be due to their action in preventing wind up and central uh, sensitization. Uh, in this study or in this uh, Cochrane review, in this review, uh, <clears throat> there was a 17 studies. They analyzed <clears throat> uh, 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 the results of using uh, ketamine by intravenous uh, infusion on prevention of chronic post-surgical pain after three and six months. And they found it is uh, 25 and 30, 25% uh, and 30% less respectively after three and six months. And in this, uh, they recommend this study, they recommended intravenous bolus dose slightly higher than the, the old recommended one. So they used two to seven uh, 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 milligram per kg as a bolus, and they used infusion of two to seven microgram per kg per minute for prevention of chronic post surgical pain. And the interesting thing is they found that adverse event rates were similar between ketamine and placebo group. Uh, the next group of drug is gabapentinoid. So gabapentinoid was initially introduced as an, an anticonvulsant in 1990s. And subsequently trials show it, it is to be beneficial in the treatment of neuropathic pain. And it found that it acts in some subunits of uh, calcium channel and it inhibit calcium influx and subsequently release of excitatory neurotransmitter in the pain pathway. Uh, it started with gabapentin, then pregabalin uh, uh, was discovered, which is structurally similar to gabapentin. And it was thought to have greater analgesic potency uh, and more favorable pharmacokinetic profile uh, uh, in, in relation to gabapentinoid. But I think this view is uh, rapidly uh, changing. So in this uh, 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 meta-analysis, uh, they studied the prevention of chronic post-surgical pain using gabapentin and pregabalin. And they included 11 trials, uh, eight studies used gabapentin and the other used uh, 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 pregabalin. And they reached to a conclusion that uh, uh, the, uh, the results the results support the role of gabapentinoid in prevention of chronic post-surgical uh, pain. And they suggested that um, there was difference between the protocols which was used during the very operative period. Some people used very high doses, which is 600 and 1200 per day. Some people started it in the operative day or pre-operative or post-operative. So there was a lot of variation in the protocol. So they are suggesting uh, uh, a trial which can use a standard uh, treatment protocol and search the results appropriately. Despite that results of this study, which was uh, published in 2012, there was another meta-analysis of randomized trial, uh, which studied 18 randomized controls trial, uh, was published and bub unpublished uh, results, and it couldn't find any reduction of chronic post-surgical pain at three months uh, 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 after using pregabalin. Uh, this was regarding the pregabalin, but I think gabapentin still have its place as a, a preventive measure for chronic post-surgical pain based on the previous uh, uh, meta-analysis. The next group of the drug is antidepressant, and all of us know the amitriptyline, fluoxetine, deloxetine, uh, venlafaxine as uh, uh, psychotic drugs which can be used for neuropathic pain. Uh, and uh, it has also uh, some roles of, uh, for prevention of chronic post-surgical pain, but it's not yet so clear. For example, we have this study by Wong uh, and his colleague, and they tried to review the use of antidepressant for the prevention of chronic post-surgical uh, uh, pain. And uh, they uh, found, um, uh, they studied the Venla vaccine, deloxetine, and the citalopram, and they have positive outcome with only uh, Venla vaccine. In one of the study, um, it, it, it compared the Venla vaccine to the effect of gabapentin, and it found that it's equally uh, uh, effective in prevention of chronic post-surgical pain as gabapentin. Uh, the last but not least is the intravenous uh, lignocaine. I know a lot of people loves intraoperative uh, intravenous lignocaine, either bolus or uh, uh, infusion. So there is a meta-analysis of uh, intraoperative IV lignocaine found reduction in acute postoperative pain. Uh, with those undergoing abdominal uh, surgery. So IV lignocaine has also been found to have anti-hyperalgesic effect that lasts for days after surgery. And remember we said the acute post-surgical pain contribute to the development of chronic post-surgical pain. So if a drug can prevent or affect 
uh, reduction of acute post-surgical pain for a couple or three days after surgery, it would help in prevention of chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, uh, just uh, we presume that. So the mechanism of action is not fully understood and it can't explain uh, fully uh, by its uh, sodium uh, channel blocking effect. Um, uh, however, a lot of findings suggest that lignocaine may have a role in preventing central sensitization and hence its prevent, uh, uh, prevention of uh, uh, chronic post-surgical pain. Um, so this uh, study um, uh, or meta-analysis of uh, some trials show perioperative li li lignocaine infusion uh, was effective in prevention of chronic post-surgical uh, pain. And for those who are uh, who likes intravenous lignocaine, I have found these uh, guidelines, which was published in 2021 about the use of intravenous lignocaine for post-operative pain and recovery. It's international consensus statement on the efficacy and safety, and some protocols are there. So it's it's uh, it's nice uh, paper if you uh, would like to have a look. Uh, drugs that is suggested to help reducing the risk of chronic post-surgical pain, but still there is no enough studies to support this, this uh, suggestion. We have non-steroids and uh, acetaminophen. There is no uh, studies that uh, that could prove the effect of uh, those two in chronic post-surgical pain, but we presume that it controlled the pain in the perioperative period in general. And remember the role prevention of acute post-surgical pain can contribute to the prevention of chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, also opioid, but remember heavy reliance on opioid alone uh, may not be sufficient. Uh, alpha-2 agonists like uh, clonidine and uh, dexamethamidine has uh, promising uh, 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 results uh, that still uh, needs to be uh, confirmed. Uh, steroids, we know that steroids is frequently used for chronic pain procedure, but there is no enough data to support the use of systemic steroid for prevention of acute uh, and the chronic post-surgical pain, so cannot be uh, recommended. Uh, the next bundle for management of chronic or prevention of post-surgical pain is to tackle the psychosocial uh, factor. And it's 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 like I would say it's it's one of the uh, duties of the surgical uh, and anesthetic team to tackle these uh, or address these issues with the patient in the very operative uh, uh, period. All of us knows, and especially who are interested in chronic. Uh, pain management, that pain perception is influenced by mood, memory, expectation, and social environment. Uh, environment. Uh, so psychosocial factors should be considered alongside the pain assessment and management using pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic uh, agents. And I always like to highlight this uh, 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 diagram. It showed here, like, if patient has an injury, he will have painful experience, and he will have two kinds of person. A uh, person who has a uh, uh, catastrophization personality leads to fear and avoidance, and this will you to lead to disuse and disability and depression, and this will lead to more painful experience, and uh, he will be in vicious circle. Other personality, is, he will have no fear, and he will have confrontation, so we will have proper recovery. So it's up to us to help the patient to be in this side or to go to this side. Uh, so... Uh, we should pay attention to the preemptive cognitive, cognitive and behavioral uh, intervention that we can employ in the perioperative period to help the patient uh, to overcome his fears of pain after in, in the post-operative uh, period. And also encourage a more positive attitude to pain relief and where possible, we should try to involve patient in their pain management strategy. If he have a previous surgery similar to the surgery he will have today, it's good to ask him what, what type of a pain uh, uh, management he have uh, last time and was he happy with this pain, pain management? Was it adequate or not? This will help a lot. And this is what we call involve the patient in his pain management. Also social relationship, like we say social balanced or balanced social relationship is mandatory to overcome pain at any time. And this includes uh, an acute post-surgical uh, point. So it's, it's like, uh, some studies for chronic pain showed that uh, when partner is present, who is attentive and likely to help them to avoid uh, activities that may exacerbate pain, then a patient is likely to report more pain and underperformance on tasks. So things should be balanced. Social relationship should not be overprotective or should not be kind of uh, um, ignoring the patient needs uh, and uh, uh, should be something in between. Um, as we say, like we can see a woman, if, if 
uh, if a woman or a man, his spouse is so protective and around all the time and trying to uh, protect him and try to be his advocate in expressing his pain and ask for analgesia for him, the more likely the patient will report pain. Uh, and again, uh, at the end, we should be managing the expectation and give the patient realistic view of his post-operative period and our plans of uh, his pain management. And by addressing these issues in the perioperative period, it may be that we can also reduce the progression uh, to, resist, to resistant pain and disability in those who are uh, at risk. The last factor is the surgical fa factors. So always we should revise the indication of surgery. As we see in, in breast augmentation surgeries, there is high risk of chronic post-surgical pain. So patients should be aware of that. Uh, and uh, he should choose based on like possibility if he can accept that or not. Also the surgical technique is recognized as a risk factor in chronic post-surgical pain. And as we mentioned, uh, so here some studies showed us, for example, this uh, study uh, uh, in Germany, uh, it um, was studying the influence of preservative versus division of ileunguinal, iliohypogastric, and genital nerve during open mesh herniography, and it found the high uh, uh, incidence of chronic post-surgical pain if the nerve was not identified of, or if it was uh, identified and uh, divided uh, versus if it was identified and uh, avoided. Uh, also, this surgery, so that laparoscopic surgery may reduce the risk of intraoperative nerve damage. And this Cochrane study involving 41 published reports of eligible trial involving 7,000, more than 7,000 uh, participants found that there was less resistant pain and numbness following the laparoscopic uh, repair. So another example, woman who, who had breast surgeries in breast cancer center where there is highly trained to uh, anesthetize and to uh, operate on those patients was found to have less incidence of developing chronic post-surgical pain uh, 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 after uh, breast cancer surgery. In general, minimal invasive surgery and less extensive technique was found to be associated with this incidence of chronic uh, post-surgical pain. This is the preventive measures, which we mentioned that it's very, very important, more important than treatment because treatment could be devastating, could be long, and patient could stay in chronic post-surgical pain even up to five and 10 years. So if the chronic post-surgical pain after all these preventive measures, we employed uh, uh, come for the chronic uh, pain surface for treatment, the treatment can be uh, 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 ranging between simple uh, uh, analgesic uh, up to interventional approach, such, such as targeted specific injection and neurostimulation even and so, in some cases. And early psychologic treatment is really, really uh, recommended in those category of patient. So just to summarize uh, uh, our uh, uh, talk today, uh, so uh, to summarize our approach to patient who is in uh, risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain, we should always ask ourselves, does the patient have perioperative pain? Is your patient having chronic ischemia uh, uh, waiting amputation? Or is he uh, uh, a trauma patient who is in pain and is still under evaluation for surgery? So if he is in pain, consider active pain management. And it's really recommended if you could reach out to the surgical teams in your hospital. Start to make protocol for those who are waiting amputation, for example, because they are at very high risk of chronic post-surgical pain and advise them if they can refer the patient who are waiting for assessment for amputation. If they are in pain, if you can start active pain treatment before surgery, use BCA, neuroaxial analgesia, or peripheral uh, nerve block. And then also ask yourself, does the patient have perioperative risk factor for developing chronic post-surgical pain? And we also know from the uh, previous slides that female, young patient, and uh, some genetic predisposed patient, and some patient who have psychosocial uh, factor or pre-existing chronic pain could be at higher risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain. So you should offer preoperative counseling and plan for your surgery and your preventive uh, analgesic measure that you will uh, use during and after the surgery. Also ask yourself, does the surgery have a higher risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain? We mentioned breast surgeries, uh, thoracotomies, amputation, inguinal hernia, uh, breast augmentation, and so on. So if you are uh, anesthetizing a patient for those surgeries, consider alternative procedure if can be. 
and alternative techniques like if for example rather than laparotomy use laparoscopy as is as as an example uh, also try to ask your surgeon if he can avoid nerve injuries uh, also from your side you should use active preventive measures like regional multimodal analgesia gabapentinoid lignocaine and ketamine in some one of the hospital i worked in a uh, um, uh, few months ago for any chronic for any uh, thoracotomy patient always he will have kind of regional, either epidural, uh, rectal spiny, uh, whatever, the, what is the kind of surgery, even if it is uh, uh, VATS, still he needs to have any kind of regional anesthesia. Also, he if he is admitted to the hospital one day before, they no, normally start gabapentinoid uh, on him. This is from surgical side, not even from the anesthetic side for prevention of chronic post-surgical pain. Also in breast surgeries, consider uh, 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 effective regional anesthesia. If you can do big block or erector spiny or whatever you can do, just a stick a needle and give some local anesthesia to prevent a lot of troubles after work. Uh, so after surgery, in uh, if acute post-surgical pain not adequately controlled, uh, uh, consider recognizing the cause. If it is infection or hematoma or whatever, uh, if you excluded other reasons, consider effective post-operative pain management. Change your uh, pain protocol you are using for this patient. If you need to uh, do a rescue block for him, don't hesitate. Also, we can use BCA, multimodal analgesia, and the regional block when uh, needed. So the take-home message is here that chronic post-surgical pain is a reality, and it makes make significant contribution to the burden of chronic pain services. Perioperative pain contribute to central sensitization and subsequent chronic post-surgical pain. Regional anesthesia techniques reduce the risk of chronic post-surgical pain in many surgeries, and you can give adjuvant analgesic, analgesic during the surgery. Some people give ketamine, IV lignocaine, magnesium sulfate, colonidine, anything that could help you prevent the or reduce the severity of acute post-surgical pain may ultimately contribute to the reduction of chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, I hope I give you um, a message that can be, uh, as Joe mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, uh, could motivate you to uh, have a minor or major changes to your practice towards preventive analgesia for chronic uh, post-surgical pain. And thank you very much for uh, the audience, the faculty, and for um, uh, Joe and Dr. Ranji. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh... I think the, from, from my point of view, the home, the take home message, uh, prevention is always easier to treatment uh, before uh, doing any surgery. If you think that uh, given any kind of regional anesthesia or local anesthesia uh, will delay the surgery, uh, think about the patient uh, three or six months later, suffering, going to the pain clinic. Uh, we should always keep that in mind. And thanks, Dr. Ahmed, for reminding us with this essential uh, uh, part of the uh, of our duties as anesthetist is uh, post-operative uh, chronic pain that we can actually, from, from your lecture, we can easily uh, and significantly reduce uh, by doing very simple uh, measures. And I think it's available in, in, in most of the hospitals uh, in any country. Um, uh, do we have a few questions? Uh, Mohammed Sorry, uh, I'm just full sorry for interruption because it's my area of interest. and. Uh, yeah. I'm one of the group searching for chronic post surgical pain. So, uh, Ferris, I want to thank, sorry for interruption, Dr. Yusuf. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for uh, making everything very simple. It's not simple like this, but make it, no, it is not. very it's simple. Not. I like it. Uh, but uh, uh, from a, a research point of view, there is nothing agreement about chronic post surgical pain, even the name. Some people give chronic post uh, operative pain. Some people just continuous post-operative pain. Even the definition, nothing about the definition agreed. And also for the drug, meta-analysis you speak about is a lot of bias in it. So it is a disease specific. So in TKR, gabapentin is very effective, but in other diseases, not effective. So it is a procedure related. This is very strong. Second thing uh, about the uh, problem of uh, persistent post-operative pain. Uh, 
Now I want to kiss your hand because you sent a message for our colleague because really we're suffering a lot, not just the patient. For my clinic, at least I get about 20, 20 to 30% of people because we don't treat a patient in the right way, I, at least from anesthesia side. So the most important thing is that multimodal analgesia to care about because don't think that immediate post-operative pain only. And uh, there is a, a, a new study showing that every 10 minutes increase and the severity of pain increases the 30% of chronic persistent or post-operative pain. And the complication of this problem, and I think Dr. Ahmed knows that from the pain clinic, it can come from quality of life to suicide uh, tendency. Many people just, yeah, yeah. there is a people get to commit suicide because of this such a problem. And also there is no relationship still in the study, Dr. Ahmed speak about age, blood, blood transfusion, and sex. It is maybe a positive in some study, not positive in some other study because we are still in the childhood of, of, of this research. But uh, as, as Ahmed said, because the last survey from uh, American Beam Society, 2012, 2015, and 2020, because don't have an, an, an a solid evidence. And this survey uh, joined about 300 or more from the bean clinician or just people working in bean. And all the time, if, if you don't have a solid evidence to go for, the uh, opinion of expertise said that the most important structure saying is the aggressive multimodal analgesia and the preventive analgesia away from the uh, preventive. And second thing to treat the psychological issue. And I remember uh, uh, in one hospital, I have, we have an um, uh, what's called a uh, psychological consultant. He just all the time went for the patient. He imitating as he's a nurse, arranging the flower and asking the patient, open a, a talk with the patient, asking him, who's doing the operation for you? He tell such a doctor, whatever the doctor tell him, oh my God, this is the best doctor here in hospital. He makes thousands of, of, of cases and no complication at all. And he agreed to make operation for you because he's very busy. And this is have a very good implication for the vision possible for psychological state. So thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed, and uh, for this uh, very simple, and uh, I, I hope the message to, 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 send, to send a message. But I want to ask you about one question only. Yes. What is the percentage of people you see in your pain clinic from this uh, coronary post-surgical pain? What's the percentage? Uh, actually, we don't have uh, a clear consensus, but as you mentioned, it's it's a lot. It could reach 30, 40%, uh, percent, some like, something like that. But the figure I have mentioned uh, in the beginning of the lecture is derived from uh, one of the studies. It's, as you mentioned, thank you for your comments, uh, I, I, I would like to say first. Uh, and as you mentioned, we are still very uh, crawling in this field, uh, and it, the field is open. Uh, for everybody to contribute in research in chronic post-surgical pain, to, trying to understand and to uh, prevent uh, as much um, as we can. And as we, as you mentioned, there is nothing, there is no clear cutoffs that this does and this doesn't. There is some studies here, some studies there about the effect of this drug in this kind of surgeries, and uh, there is no enough data in the same drug in another kind of uh, uh, surgeries. So I think um, every anesthetist in every research center around the world is invited to contribute. It doesn't all, it doesn't matter or it doesn't uh, affect uh, or it is not related to chronic pain surface only. But every anesthetist should. Uh, pay attention to some preventive measure uh, during uh, the surgery. The figure is in my service uh, because I, I work in pediatric hospital uh, at the moment for my rotation. So in my previous uh, hospital where I work in pain clinic, it was a lot, but uh, we, we don't have clear figures to uh, to answer uh, you, your question. The, th the interesting thing in your uh, talk about the, the psychologist who is approaching the patient is a nurse. I was really asking myself, if you, from your point of view, was he successful in um, uh, alleviating the acute post-surgical pain at least? Or if you have any, uh, or if he from his side has any data to suggest that uh, uh, he has, uh, or this technique has an, has an effect on the outcome of chronic post-surgical pain, uh, because uh, I don't know, like I, I think in many countries it's not uh, accepted that any anybody can uh, approach a patient and it introduce himself as somebody else, um, because in many countries this is uh, not accepted. But if it is, um, if it is, if, if it have an impact on the results, 
this could be employed by different ways in different hospitals, not necessarily by the same way pretending that you're somebody else, um, as I mentioned, because it could lead to legal uh, consequences in some other countries. But I really appreciate what he does and his trial to uh, help the patient in, in your uh, hospital. Uh, sorry, Dr. Ahmed, it's not my hospital. It's another way of working yeah. place for yeah. research. It do research and it's not yeah. introducing the self for uh, the, the patient. Just yeah. going to arrange the uh, flowers and to, to open a uh, talk to the patient. And she have a very good implication up till now, but we still, as I told you, in the early stage to collecting the data. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, I just you. misunderstood. Thank yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh... Thank you, Dr. Reda. Uh, we, we, just, uh, we just have a few minutes left uh, for this presentation. If you just, Dr. Ahmed, go uh, through this question quickly. Uh, from Mohamed Suleiman, which do you prefer, clonidine or dexamethasone? I personally use clonidine. Uh, like, it's, it's not uh, the com common practice in, in, maybe you know that, Yusuf, it's not common practice in Ireland. And most of us use clonidine. And uh, it has a lot of uh, data to prove that it's effective in acute uh, uh, post-surgical pain. And uh, it has opioid sparing effect as well, but there is no evidence yet that it could be beneficial in chronic post-surgical pain. From your experience, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed, uh, do you think clonidine is safe for day case surgeries for post-operative uh, patients? Uh, well, I don't think there is any, I'm not aware of uh, any, uh, any guidelines or any uh, studies that um, it could uh, say it's not safe. We use it in, 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 in my current practice and I used it in some other hospital before in day cases and I saw a lot of anesthetic consultant. Uh, if you use a small dose of one mic per kg, um, uh, not in every uh, single patient, a lot of they, you know, they uh, cases now are expanding to include more complicated surgeries, uh, like uh, uh, lab cholecystectomy in the past, it, patients should stay in the hospital, but now it's a day surgery. Also inguinal hernia, which has high risk of uh, uh, pain in the post-operative period. So we give them clonidine actually, and uh, I'm not aware of anything that can go against that. All right, okay. Uh, second question about local wound infiltration. What is the best area, subcutaneous, dermal, or epidermal? Subcutaneous, dermal, or epidermal? Well, uh, I think, you know, uh, if, if you are taking bone harvesting, uh, 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 harvesting bone from an uh, alia uh, crest, I, I always still ask the, 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 the surgeon to infiltrate around the periosteum and deep in the tissue. But you know, I don't think any infiltration in the skin would help in this uh, uh, occasion. Uh, uh, and also injecting the, 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 the local anesthetic into the muscle, uh, uh, it could have, you know, a recent studies showed that it have myotoxic effect. So I would always recommend it subcutaneous and in infiltration deep in the periosteum if the uh, uh, bone uh, surgery was uh, uh, operated. Do you recommend to have a course of communication skills and preoperative patient psychology? Uh, psychology, psychology. Allow me to rephrase this uh, uh, in another way. Uh, do you suggest information leaflets or direct communication uh, for uh, preoperative uh, post chronic uh, post surgical chronic pain orientation? Well, Joe, you know uh, um, this is a very good question, actually. What I would say, like any kind of uh, communication with the patient to deliver the information regarding his expected pain and chronic uh, and uh, post-operative pain would be helpful. If you are working in a center which operates high volume of a specific patient, like if you are working in, in a cardiothoracic center where you have a lot of thoracotomy patient, mm -hmm. there is no harm to prepare a leaflet but you should choose to which kind of patient are you going to give this leaflet. Because at the end of the day, what you need is to make the information clear to the patient. Some patients will not understand from the leaflet. It's, there is no harm to give leaflet, but at, also before the surgery, you need to apply kind of verbal communication with the patient, at least to make sure 
that the patient got the message you want to give to him. It's not only give him leaflet, then what if he didn't read? For us, if you have a leaflet from any seller of anything, I don't think you are going through the leaflets uh, uh, carefully. Sometimes you miss important information. So giving leaflets and having some programs sometimes to uh, uh, prepare the patient for the post-operative period and rehabilitation, communicate with the patient yourself. As anesthetist, and I think the majority of the audience in this webinar are anesthetists, it's not visible to arrange kind of leaflets. It's normally the surgeons who are looking after this uh, part of communication. But from your side, make sure that whatever the kind uh, of communication was used with your patient in the perioperative period, just make sure that he got the message. This is what I want to say. Okay, I will just take only one last question for him, uh, uh, from Joe, Mohamed Salim. Uh, Joe, is this a, is this a question from Mohamed Salim? Dr. Mohamed Khatib, uh, okay. Khatib, he wants to talk. Dr. Mohamed? Dr. Khatib? Is he here? Um, he can talk, Dr. Mohamed Khatib? No, okay, you go ahead, do a doctor. Okay, so uh, we'll take only one last question from Mohammed Salim. Uh, uh, local steroids have uh, a rule. I think he's he's asking, is local steroids like dexamethasone have a rule in uh, CBSP? And also he's asking about magnesium intravenous, which is common in Ireland as well uh, as intraoperative and sometimes postoperative uh, pain. Uh, control. Uh, off you go. Yeah. So there, there, there was no data about magnesium sulfate uh, usage. As, as you noticed uh, at the end of my lecture, there is uh, some drugs which has some accepted level of evidence. I wouldn't say it's convincing level of evidence as uh, uh, as uh, uh, me uh, during the lecture and. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and as we discussed after the after the lecture, that it, it's not clear cut evidence, but there is some drugs which have some accepted level of evidence. Some drugs showed evidence in prevention of acute post surgical pain, and as we mentioned, prevention of acute post surgical pain in itself could help in prevention of chronic post surgical pain. Clonidine is one of it. Opioid is one of it. But think about opioid. Uh, for example, patient after cardiac surgery, chronic, uh, f f coronary bypass uh, grafting, they have significant uh, uh, percentage of developing chronic post-surgical pain, and they are flooded with opioid in the post-operative period. It's helped to relieve acute post-surgical pain, but still, it doesn't do anything for chronic post-surgical pain. Magnesium sulfate is one of the drugs that it should affect to reduce opioid sparing effect, reduce opioid hyperalgesia, reduce requirement of opioid in the post-operative period. This is all well established, but it has no clear role in prevention of chronic post-surgical pain yet. It could have been, but there is no evidence. Okay. What was the other part of the question, Joe? Sorry? Uh, it was uh, about the steroids and magnesium sulfate. Oh, I, I yes, think yes, 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 I answer the part of magnesium. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, uh, that's true. The steroids, we used to use steroid uh, injection in the surgical site uh, with uh, variable access rate. So it's described in the treatment, and it's one of the lines of the treatment is to inject steroid either around the nerve or in the area of the vein. We do that, and uh, 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 some patients show good response, not resistant. Some of them will have pain relief for six weeks, up to six, uh, six months, and still they come back at the end of the day. Some of them doesn't have uh, uh, any response at all. And as I mentioned, in some centers, not the same center I work in, at the end, uh, when they fail to relieve their pain by all of the recognized measure, they go for neuromodulation and sometimes spinal cord stimulator insertion. And the last question, I think you already uh, answered. I'm okay so, to get uh, no. No, like. Just because of the time, that's the last question. I think you answered uh, the, the CBSP is, is a result of acute actual nerve injury damage, glioid formation, local traction, or distension. I think you, you mentioned that it's a mix of, uh, of all of these. Uh, depending on the type of the surgery. Uh, so uh, I think that's it. Um, I, I, I apologize if we did not answer uh, more questions.